Welcome, everybody. My name is Anna Gjnabusa. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And we're delighted today to welcome Kim Lane Chapley. She's the Lawrence Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School and the University Center for Human Values, as well as the Director of Program in Law and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Previously, she was the John O'Brien Professor of Comparative Law at the Pennsylvania School of Law. And before that, she was a Thurner Professor here at the University of Michigan in the Department of Political Science, as well as holding appointments in the Departments of Sociology, the Women's Studies Program, the Law School, and the Ford School. So there are a variety of constituencies that are welcoming her back today for this homecoming. <laughs> Professor Shepley's work focuses on comparative constitutional law and the emergence and collapse of constitutional systems. After 1989, she has focused her attention on the transformation of countries previously under Soviet domination into constitutional rule of law states. She spent several years living in Hungary and in Russia, studying the constitutional courts of each country and examining the ways in which the new constitutions have entered the public consciousness. Her many publications on post-communist constitutional transformation have appeared in law reviews and in social science journals. In addition, she has written an award-winning book, Legal Secrets, and has published on subjects ranging from insider trading to feminist jurisprudence and the rule of law to the effects of international war and terror on constitutional protections around the world. In short, she's a preeminent expert on comparative constitutional law. There's simply no one better qualified to help us better understand Hungary's constitutional crisis. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome Professor Shepley today to give a talk entitled Hungary's Unconstitutional Constitution. Welcome. Great. Well, I am completely delighted to be um, back in Ann Arbor, and there's bright lights, so if I look slightly stunned, it might be that. But um, anyway, I'm really delighted to be back because really it was living um, here that actually got me started on Eastern Europe, and I left in 1994 to move to Budapest for what I thought was one year. It turned into four years, and I actually didn't come back. So I feel really like now I have to tell you what I was doing, like all this time working on Hungary. So I'm, I'm grateful for to see so many friends and to have, and I know that there's a lot. This is April, and this is the last week of the semester. So I know there's a lot going on. So I'm grateful also for the size of the crowd. Um, anyway, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's been happening um, in Hungary. And I have, a, I have a number of slides that I'm going to go through really quickly. And I'm going to leave slides behind. So if anybody sees anything that they want, want to see it at greater, ah, wonderful, one of my Princeton students. Um, anyway, so if anyone sees anything they want to review at more length, you can, you're welcome to, to look at the slides um, after. So I'm here to talk about Hungary because Hungary has, as of January 1st, um, a new constitution and actually a new constitutional order um, made possible by the fact that there was sort of a, a double fluke in the Hungarian constitutional system before um, this political party, Fidesz, won the election in 2010. Um, there was a combination of two um, provisions in the prior constitutional order that made what's now happened possible. One is that there was a disproportionate election law, and that disproportionate election law meant that when Fidesz, this current political party, got 53% of the party list votes in the 2010 election, it meant they wound up with 68% of the seats in the parliament. That law was created in 1989-90 because everyone thought that Hungary was going to devolve into a bunch of tiny parties and it would be very hard to form coalitions. So they wanted to put their thumb on the scale of some of the, of the plurality parties to ensure they could actually build stable governments. And so that rule has persisted to the present day and it has created this incredible supermajority. Um, the other rule that actually uh, led to our current situation was that the Constitution of 1989-90 um, which was always meant to be a temporary constitution, um, had in it a very easy amendment rule, which was that a single two-thirds vote of the parliament could change anything. So if you combine this supermajority electoral law with the constitution, essentially what you get is this, which is a brand new constitution written all by one political party. Um, and this constitution has come in for a lot of criticism. I'm happy in the Q&A to take up some of the EU criticism in particular, which is starting to have some teeth, um, has generated a lot of problems. So the question is, yeah, there, good. Um, so then the question is, what um, is this? Oh, I, sorry, that's what's happened. I was there. I was looking at my iPad, and it was not being affected by this. OK. so. Um, what I'm going to try to talk about today is my sort of much more internal critique of this constitution by asking a question that seems like an absurdity to people who actually focus on constitutional um, systems, which is, can a constitution, a whole constitution, be unconstitutional? 
And the answer is actually, well, yes, it can, if you have some standard external to the Constitution itself that defines what a Constitution is or should be, and that this Constitution violates that. So what I'm going to try to do is to show you four different arguments for why this might be true. Um, one is if a Constitution violates basic principles of the kind of Constitution it's supposed to be. And in this particular case, I want to argue that a liberal Constitution has to have certain essential features uh, that, in fact, the Hungarian Constitution is going to lack. That's what I'm going to call a Constitution that's unconstitutional by definition. The second is when the Constitution relied for being passed on a mechanism for its creation that turns out to be invalid. You know, so if, for example, a Constitution required a certain kind of a supermajority vote and the vote was missing and then they said it had happened, that would be an invalidity problem, right, where something that was supposed to have didn't. This is unconstitutional through failed legality. The third um, is when the Constitution, in order to, to create a Constitution, the standard theory from Emmanuel Sayez on through some unlikely figures like Carl Schmitt and beyond, the basic argument is that you have to constitute what's called a constituent power, which is to say you have to form enough public agreement behind a text that there really is support for changing the essential features of a constitutional order. I'm going to argue they didn't do that. And then finally, I want to make what's actually in Hungary a really controversial argument, but I'll try it out on you guys. Um, I tried it out there, and you know I'm working on it, um, which is that there is something when a, when a country decides to write a new constitution, it should be recognizably the constitution of that place and that it needs to embed some of the country's best traditions. And there's an argument about what's best traditions. But I want to say that on any sensible reading of Hungarian constitutional history, this constitution also fails that test. Um, and so the basic law is going to turn out to be unconstitutional, I think, in all four senses. So what does this constitution do? Well, this is just a picture of what happened in the last election, just to give you a sense of the overwhelming majority that Fides, which is on orange, that's always their color, got, okay, and this shows you the distribution of the vote. Essentially what you've got is a really tiny opposition. The opposition here is divided into three parties. MSP is the legacy socialist party, which ran the government for the preceding eight years, and they only got 15% of the vote. There's then this little party at the bottom called LMP, which is, stands for Lehit Masha Politica, which means politics can be different. They just barely uh, made it into the parliament over the 5% threshold. And then there's this group called Jobbik. Uh, and now Jobbik is really basically a neo-Nazi party, and I don't use those terms lightly. This is a party that's campaigned on extreme nationalism, on leaving the EU, on a largely very publicly anti-Semitic, anti-Roma rhetoric, and they have a paramilitary that's been going around beating people up. Uh, particularly Roma and Jews, but also people who defend them and or criticize the government. So it's a serious party, and so one of the, I mean, a serious kind of challenge. And so what you see is that the political opposition, if you combine those three parties, well, they can't work together, right? Those of you who remember the Weimar Republic may recall that one of the problems was that was that um, there was, the, the sort of parliament was divided a third, a third, a third, liberals, communists, um, fascists, and you could always get a unification of the extremes against the middle, in this case, you've got Fidesz positioning itself as the middle, and its opposition is divided between two groups that can't work together. So this is one of the reasons why there's no effective parliamentary opposition. So how did this constitution come into effect? Well, the constitution was allegedly written on an iPad. That's why that little cartoon is there. Uh, Joseph Sire, an, uh, an MEP, allegedly wrote it on his iPad. Uh, actually, it was a slightly more complicated process than that. But it, it sailed through from first draft to final enactment in a month. So there wasn't very much public conversation about it. The Constitution is a little bit of an empty shell. So when you read the Constitution, it very often says, and the details will be filled in by what they call a Scharkerlatterstörvein, <coughs> or a cardinal law. So there are these constitutional laws that supplement the Constitution. And when I talk about the constitutional order today, I'm going to talk about the whole thing. Because in fact, they sort of put all the least toxic stuff in the Constitution itself, so that when you read it, it doesn't sound so bad. But when you add it to all of these constitutional laws, then you see that a lot of these problems emerge. So I want to talk about the whole system. It's not all fully in place yet. So let's go through these four arguments on whether a constitution can be constitutional or not. The first one's going to take more time than the others, because in the context of telling you about the first argument, I have to explain the system. So don't worry, not all four are going to be as long as the first one um, will be. And so the question is, what's a liberal constitution? And 
again, I can go on about the foundations of these ideas, but the basic idea, usually when you talk about liberal constitutions, is that they ensure something like separation of powers and rights, checks on powers and rights. And to that, I want to add, actually, a third element that is really curiously, it seems to me, left out of most of the literature on liberal, liberal constitutions, which, have to, which is that they have to ensure a rotation of party power, right? A rotation of power among political fractions. It's really interesting to me how that's just not in the constitutional literature. And so I've added to the usual two things you say about liberal constitutions, this third thing about the capacity to rotate power among political fractions. Um, and it turns out, I think, that the EU, and there's a long story we could, I see Daniel Halberstam here, who's the expert on all of this stuff, um, but it turns out that I think the EU also really requires states to have liberal constitutions. Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union actually lays out a bunch of desiderata, which aren't exactly the three I mentioned, but which really are very hard to achieve without some rotation of power, checks on power, and guarantees of rights. Um, so. Is Hungary's, is, is Hungary's constitution liberal? Well, let's start with the idea about the multi-party republic or the capacity to kind of rotate leadership. Now, there's first of all just a little thing which is I think a matter of, of just terminology, but it may be more ominous than that. The name of the country used to be the Republic of Hungary and the constitution changes it to Hungary. And in fact, when I was giving a talk on this subject in Budapest in January, I was speaking on a panel chaired by a member of the current constitutional court. And when I gave this talk about multi-party republic as being one of the things that has to be guaranteed by a liberal constitution, he said, why are you so fixated on the idea of a republic? To which I thought, well, geez, you know, you can have direct democracy or you can have republics, I said to him, or I said in public, you can have some other form, which is not particularly democratic. So what exactly do you have in mind? But there, there are people from the, this guy's a constitutional judge now. So there are people from the governing party that are literally saying we're post-republic without actually saying what that means. So that's one thing. But the more crucial thing from my standpoint is that very little about these changes really is multi-party. And you'll see this as I go through the talk and try to lay out more of the criteria, but the key institutions and offices are all dominated by members of this particular party or their, um, their allies. So the Constitution sets up a number of offices that are the sort of checking institutions on power um, that turn out to be almost all electable by single two-thirds votes of the parliament which, as you've seen, means in this particular government that this particular party has the votes to put their own loyalists into all of these positions. And, and you'll see these are all kind of important checking positions. Um, the new election law, which has gone into effect as part of the constitutional order, essentially, according to one um, uh, uh, think tank that's analyzed this, a think tank, by the way, I should say, that's associated with the political opposition. So every time I say this, the government folks always tell me you can't use their numbers, to which I want to say, okay, do you have any other numbers? And they have never produced any. But this one think tank has shown that the, the new districts and the election law actually puts in it the actual district boundaries. The law is 110 pages, of which 10 pages is rules and 100 pages is boundaries. I mean, literally down the street of this village and over is in the law, and the law can only be changed by a future two-thirds vote of the parliament. And it turns out that under those districts, um, and looking at the elections that have happened in Hungary, in which the almost every election has resulted in the opposite party coming to power, the only election where that wasn't true was 2006, Fidesz, the current governing party, would have come to power in 1998, and it would never have been voted out since under those districts. So a lot of us think the election law is a little bit rigged in their favor. And I think most crucially, every time this governing party has the opportunity to entrench their power, they've taken it, which is to say they've never offered to share, to, con to discuss, to have any kind of real dialogue with the opposition, so they're using all the party that they have. So let's get to the core of the debate, though, about separation of powers, because a lot of my argument about what's wrong with this Constitution relies on the thought that, in fact, the Constitution actually has very few checks um, on the power of the, of the governing party at the moment. And the first thing to say with respect to that is that Hungary is one of the unicameral parliamentary systems in Europe. And unicameral parliamentary systems are basically guaranteed, of course, to have a majority for virtually everything they're going to do. So then the question is, at least if you have a stable coalition, so the question is what stops this government from just railroading through everything it does? And the answer is usually that you need a number of 
other bodies checking it or elaborated parliamentary procedure. And before 2010, um, Hungary had a very powerful constitutional court that had the so-called axio popularis jurisdiction. And axio popularis is just a fancy way of saying that anyone, including anyone in this room, before January 1st of this year, could have filed a petition with the constitutional court challenging the constitutionality of any law in Hungary. You didn't have to show that you were affected. You didn't have to show that you were harmed. You know, it was just, and so there were these like retired lawyers in Seged who would write these petitions, you know, and it was really quite a charming thing. And that's why I went to study. That's when I left Michigan. I went to study that process um, there. And that was actually a very effective way of ensuring that virtually every law got constitutional review. Because if there's hardly any barriers to bringing the petition, then every, practically every law was, was the subject of a constitutional court decision. So the constitutional court was acting like an upper chamber of the parliament, as it were. And that was a very important check. Um, Hungary also had an independent judiciary, as you might imagine. Uh, it had a number of independent bodies. Um, so an independent election commission, an independent media board, an independent state audit office, an independent public prosecutor's office, all these kinds of um, bodies that were, again, sort of provided checks on power, audits of state books and so forth. Um, there was also a very elaborate parliamentary procedure that required, as part of the normal way of introducing a bill, required consultation with both opposition groups and with civil society groups. So there was this very elaborate, you couldn't introduce a bill in the parliament unless you had actually consulted all of the affected parties and could document that you had done that. Um, and there were a system of reasonably strong autonomous local governments. Well, all of these have now been undermined. So I'm going to go through these um, quickly one by one. Um, the constitutional court has essentially been gutted. Um, and they, this has been done through a series of steps. Uh, the first thing that happened was that the Fidesz government, when it came in, changed the method of, of electing judges to the bench. It used to be the case that you could only be elected as a judge of the constitutional court if you first went through a committee of the parliament in which each parliamentary party got one vote. And then your nomination went out to the floor of the parliament where it had to get a two-thirds vote of all the members. So that gave minority parties a really substantial blocking vote. And what it meant in practice was that you'd have to wait for several judgeships to come open at once, and then they'd do a deal, you know, where the small parties would get somebody and the governing party would get somebody else. And so what that meant was that the court was always relatively balanced and really couldn't be captured. So what Fidesz did was it came in and it eliminated the first step. So that now all you need to get onto the court is a two-thirds vote of the parliament, which they have. Okay. So what happened next? So the next thing they did was to pack the court. They increased the number of judges from 11 to, to 15. It turns out they had two judgeships of people who were retiring from the bench. So that immediately gave them, actually with three, so that immediately gave them flat out seven judges to name in their first two years. So in two years they've named seven judges, three of whom don't actually have the qualifications to be constitutional judges, about which more you know, later, but it, it's, a, it's not exactly a very um, distinguished independent uh, group, although some are actually, a couple are quite well-known faculty. Um, but as a sense, they've got a, now a majority of Fidesz loyalists on the court. So then what they did was they eliminated the jurisdiction of the court, so the court can no longer review any budget or tax measures, which happened just before the government nationalized all the private pensions. <coughs> which is now exempt from constitutional review. There are 8,000 cases at the European Court of Human Rights actually on this question now. So even if they've eliminated constitutional court review, people are still going to Strasbourg. So they've removed the, the ability of the constitutional court, even packed with their own loyalists, to review big swaths of policy. They abolished this, way, this uh, method of access through which anybody could ensure that a law was reviewed by the court. And they substituted for it a German-style constitutional complaint mechanism, which is a good thing. It used to be that the constitutional court couldn't deal with retail-level violations of rights, which they now can do. But the problem with the German constitutional complaint mechanism is that it's not very easy to get at the constitutionality of structures through the mechanism of the individual rights complaint. And the court, I just, yesterday the papers, Hungarian papers reported that the new constitutional court now has 633 new petitions but they've made no decisions since mid-December. Mid They're just not functioning uh, at all. So this will mean the Constitutional Court can't act as the kind of check it was. Um, on the judiciary, then the government has also gone after the ordinary judiciary. So they just made an announcement. They amended the constitutional law on the judiciary to suddenly lower the retirement age from 70 to 62. Of course, this is in an era in which, yes, retirement ages are changing all over the world and all over Europe, but they're always going up, right? 
This is one of the few cases where the retirement age came down, so why? The answer is that the Hungarian system, like most judiciaries, operates on a seniority system. And with that single move, what opened up was 10% of the seats on the judiciary, including about half of the court presidencies of all the courts all over the country and one fifth of the, no, one quarter of the Supreme Court. All those judgeships all of a sudden came open, and then the question was, so how are they going to fill at all these jobs? And by the way, they'd had a moratorium on replacing any new judges for the preceding year because they wanted to take the power out of the hands of the prior president of the Supreme Court who ran the prior process because he had been a judge on the European Court of Human Rights for 17 years, and they didn't want him to pick the judges. So they created a new office called the National Judicial Office, which now screens and vets and picks all judges. And the National Judicial Office is essentially one person um, who has two deputies that she names. And this one person turns out to be one of the closest friends of the prime minister and his wife and the wife of the guy who drafted the Constitution on his iPad. Um, but of course, she's also a, a lawyer and um, a professional. And so it could be that she's going to manage this job with all the professionalism that the job requires. The problem is this office not only names all the judges, more or less single-handedly, but can promote or demote any judge, move any judge anywhere in the country, and then by a little last minute constitutional amendment that happened during the holidays when no one was paying attention, this person now has the capacity to assign any concrete case to any judge in the country. So the judiciary now, and, and in the first four months of this year, 10% of the judiciary has been replaced by Fidesz appointees that have come through this system, and there are more is coming, okay? So the judiciary, is no longer what it was. Dismantling independent bodies. Well, there, Hungary had this whole string of independent bodies, um, the Electoral Commission Media Board, you can see the list um, there. And all of these um, had been set up in, this, in the immediate post-Soviet period to either require for something like the state audit office or the public prosecutor or the ombudsman lots of specialized expertise in the area. So these were really expertise-driven positions. And there was always multi-party kind of parliamentary consensus agreement on who filled these jobs. Well, now all these jobs are filled by a two-thirds vote of the parliament. And it turns out all the prior occupants of all these offices were disqualified suddenly by a sudden change in the qualifications for office. So just to, to give you one more egregious case, this president of the Supreme Court, whom the Fidesz folks didn't want to leave there, had been a judge of the European Court of Human Rights for 17 years. He'd only been president of the Supreme Court for three years. So suddenly in the new law, in order to be a member of the Supreme Court, you have to have been a judge in Hungary for five years. So he's disqualified. So he had to leave office as of January 1st. And they've done equivalent things with all of these offices, essentially firing people in midterm. And therefore, now, with a two-thirds vote of the parliament filling all these slots, all of these slots are the ones where every single member of every single board is appointed by Fidesz. And it's all, and the main criteria for public office are, is party membership or a party loyalty. So, for example, the head of the state audit office has no background in accounting and whose main career has been party offices all the way up. And you can, again, the electoral commission, which controls referenda, it's all the, the five seats that the government controlled, it's all government people, and they have a, you know, a by far dominant majority. The media board, um, the prime minister literally appoints the head of the media board for nine years. And all the members of the media board are elected for nine years by a two-thirds, I can, I can, that's like a chorus, a two-thirds vote of the parliament, right? So everything requires this two-thirds. It's like the magic two-thirds. And so all of these offices have now been filled with Fidesz party loyalists. And because these offices, there's a four-year parliamentary cycle. Some of the, the state audit office is a 12-year term. So these folks are going to be there for two, three, and maybe four parliamentary cycles. And all, almost all of those jobs say in the law that if a two-thirds vote, if, if a parliamentary two-thirds can't agree on their replacement, the existing person can stay in office until they get a two-thirds. So these are minimum terms, the nine years, the 12 years, the whatever. So that's why I'm saying there are all these choke points. And these folks have really crucial veto positions or hassle possibilities in case any other power, uh, party comes to power. So parliamentary procedure used to be quite robust. And that's actually also disappeared. Um, so it turns out there was a provision in the old parliamentary procedure that allowed any MP to introduce a private member's bill, which is you know, normal in parliamentary systems. 
And the, but the private member's bill in Hungarian parliamentary procedure uh, meant that you didn't have to do that widespread consultation with affected groups and opposition parties. The thought was that an MP doesn't have the resources to do that if it's just a private MP. And so you can skip that stage. So it turns out almost this entire system that I'm describing to you, which includes not just 12 omnibus constitutional amendments changing between 50 and 60, depending on how you count provisions of the old constitution, the new constitution, and 368 other laws. It's a full-time job just to read all the laws. Almost all of those have been introduced by private members' bills, including, by the way, the constitution itself. So by using the private members' bill, and, and then there's party line votes, so it's all the Fidesz people vote for it, and everybody else either walks out or votes no. So these are all straight party line votes through which this whole system has gone through. And what that's actually meant is that there's no consultation, right, because that stage was abolished. Um, and it means that, the, that these are government bills because it's essentially all the gov members of the governing party who vote for all of them, but the private members' bill has actually been used for virtually all of this. But, you know, it turns out there was still a little bit of debate. Every once in a while the opposition would get the floor to say something, and this was annoying um, to the government. And so on the very last day of the year, well, actually the very last day of the parliamentary year, December 30th, while people were on holiday, they passed a new change to the parliamentary procedure, which now allows a, vote, a bill to go from first introduction to final vote with no debate if a two-thirds vote of the parliament agrees that you can just have the fine. So now there's no parliamentary debate. So a lot of us following this have trouble figuring out, is the law passed or not? Was there a vote? Because there's no recorded debate. There's no scheduled debate. It's just a vote. And so that's where we are right now with the system. Finally, local governments. Um, so local governments were a source of some independent power in Hungary, among other things. They were rotated on a different electoral cycle than the, than the main um, uh, government. But now local governments have been really gutted. So the first is that, just like in Putin's you know, Russia, where there was this set of regional governors, remember, that were set up in order to try to control the regions, now there's this new set of, they're called Yarash, which is one of these, the other things, they're renaming everything to be from the, you know, from the mythical period of Hungarian nationalism. So that's one of these institutions that hasn't existed in modern times, but it's a set of regional governors. Hungary's the size of Indiana, right? It doesn't actually need probably regional governors. Um, but now they have a set of them, and they're all, of course, Fidesz appointees. They're part of the administrative structure, and they're now supervising the local governments. Um, the local governments can't fund any kind of public works projects above a very small amount without getting central <coughs> government approval. And as of January 1st, hospitals and schools, which had been decentralized after the end of communism, have now been re-centralized. And as I put there, every single school principal in the country had to reapply for their jobs. We're all waiting to find out who all the new principals are. And they didn't do a review of all the schools. So if they're trying to get the most effective educators to stay on and to deal with the troubled schools, there has been no such infrastructure laid for determining which schools are effective and which aren't. So we're all very interested to see what are the criteria for the new principals. So what all of this means, I've just now gone through that checklist of all the things that had been checks in the old system that have all been dismantled now. And so there are virtually no checks left in the system on this government, right? So the Constitutional Court's not going to overrule them. The Electoral Commission's not going to allow a referendum through. You know, all these things that could check the government are basically eroded. And in the meantime, these checking offices have all been filled by party loyalists who will stay there into the next well, not the next millennium, but, you know, the next decade. Okay, so we've, ha we've seen multi-party politics is basically the rotation of power is something that now is, I think, in doubt. Checks and balances, separation of powers is really undermined. The third has to do with rights, and I'm not going to say a lot about rights. The Constitution lists all the right rights. Um, some of them are problematically worded. There's a few things that the um, Venice Commission, which is the European Commission, democracy through law when they reviewed the Constitution. They had a few quibbles about the rights provisions. But by and large, this is not a government that's going to operate from a frontal assault on rights. Instead, the thing you really have to worry about is that a government without any checks on power is a government that has a lot of power to infringe rights. And it may not matter, actually, what the Constitution says much. So the worry here is really that this is a government in a, in, that has in place a lot of mechanisms for making people's lives miserable 
without very many mechanisms for redressing grievances. And so the worry is that that lays the groundwork for infringement um, of rights. All right, so is the Constitution liberal? As you think, as you can imagine, I'm going to say the answer is no, because it exactly doesn't guarantee rotation of power, checks on power, and rights. So it may be some other kind of constitution, but not a liberal one. Okay, so that's, I told you the first argument was really long. The next three are going to go much faster. Um, so is the Constitution legally valid? This is actually, if you get the iPad app of the new Hungarian Basic Law, which it has, although what's very interesting is that the iPad app has on it the version that passed um, a year ago, which has, which is not that bad when you read it, and it has never been updated to include all the toxic amendments they've added since. It's really, I keep waiting for the update, but it doesn't happen. So that's the artwork, um, which will tell you a little bit about the, the kind of official ideology of the of the Constitution. But this argument is slightly technical, so I'm, I'm just going to go through it really quickly because for, for logicians this is really appealing and for everyone else it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the new Constitution was passed using the amendment rules of the prior Constitution, which was drafted in 8990. Okay, so a single two-thirds vote, as I told you at the beginning, could change anything. And they used their two-thirds vote to change anything. But the problem is that the, that Constitution, the post-communist Constitution, had actually been amended in 1995. And in that 1995 amendment, it said it took not a two-thirds vote, but a four-fifths vote to start a new constitutional drafting process. However, the four-fifths vote was never entrenched. So how do you amend the four-fifths rule? All together now <laughs> with a two-thirds vote, okay. So what did Fidesz do? They used their two-thirds vote to take out the four-fifths rule which then allowed them to write a constitution. Okay, so that's one way in which you might say this is a little bit invalid, because it, it's not formally illegal, but it kind of doesn't smell right, you know. Um, but actually, the other thing that's quite interesting is that this is, they have this thing called the National Avowal, which is the constitutional preamble, which is full of a lot of really quite interesting rhetoric. And it's written in this kind of archaic Hungarian. So when I first got the new constitutional text, I looked at it, and I thought, oh my god, I can't understand it, because it's, I just do modern Hungarian. I don't really do this kind of really flowery kind of, you know, you have to read poetry to understand this vocabulary. But um, one of the things the preamble of the Constitution does is it basically says, you know, we are, first of all, starting over. But second of all, we don't recognize anything that's a legacy of the communist era. Okay? Uh, and so what they do is they repudiate the communist Constitution, which was the Constitution of 1949. Okay? And they don't recognize any legal enactment until the first democratic parliament sits in May of, of 1990. Okay. Now, okay, so this is basically what this language tells you. So what's the little lesson in modern constitutional history? The, the first written constitution Hungary ever had was this 1949 constitution. It got amended and amended using the two-thirds rule from the 1949 Constitution. Sorry, this is slightly technical, but that was how you amended the Constitution. So the 1989 Roundtable produced a new Constitution by amending the Stalinist-era Constitution with 100-plus amendments, okay? Um, and then after the first elections, when the new parliament sat May 2nd, 1990, they made a whole other series of amendments. And then in 1995, they added the four-fifths rule, okay? So now think about what this repudiation of everything between 1949 and May 2nd, 1990 does. The original 1949 Constitution is no longer legally valid, but also it means all that stuff that happened in October of 1989 is no longer valid either because the date for resuming legitimacy is after that. So they've introduced the current Constitution by following the procedures outlined in the 1989, 90, 1990 Constitution which no longer exists. So it's a slightly technical ar argument to say they relied on, a, on an amendment rule that they nullified, right? So it's legally invalid. Some people find this an attractive argument. But in this way, this actually tells you that's the, the old preamble that said that we should have a new constitution. The problem now is that they've essentially amended the constitution using a rule that no longer exists. Okay, so it could be that the constitution isn't legally valid at, at all if that's why they did it. Okay, so let me, t let me try a couple more last minute, you know, sort of substantive arguments. Um, did the government actually constitute a new constituent power? Now, there's a, there's a long version we can get into about what's a constituent power and how do you know if you have it, but the basic idea is that the moment of constitutional design 
moment of constitutional drafting has to be a moment when a constituent power is summoned, which is to say that there has to be not just an ordinary governing process, but something that is actually quite special. If you, if you read Sayez, he relies on the Rousseauian idea, slightly modified, of a general will, but there has to be something more than ordinary governance to, to ground a constitution. This is actually where Sayez says, and essentially if you have this constituent power, one of the things it means is that you don't have to follow the prior rules. So if you believe there's this constituent power moment, then it may not matter that the Constitution is legally invalid in some strict sense. There's often some kind of original sin of illegality at the origins of most constitutions anyway, including the American one. Um, and so maybe it doesn't matter. Um, and so instead, what you might say is if they, con if they had a new constituent power, then we wouldn't worry about it. So did they. Um, and so this is more on, actually it's up through Carl Schmitt, there's a whole sort of set of theoretical arguments about how you know when you have this power, but this is where I really wanted to, to get to. Um, how was this process actually conducted? Well, it was all Fides, as you saw, right? In fact, no one else in the Hungarian political spectrum was arguing for a new constitution. Fidesz, when it ran for office in, in 2010, did not promise a new constitution. In fact, some of their party members actually said during the campaign, if we get a two-thirds, which was always a possibility given the electoral law, we will not have a new constitution. Okay, so it, it doesn't seem to have this kind of mandate. And as soon as they started the process, they started losing voters. So by now they've lost more than half the people who voted for them. Um, and so, did they consult? Well, this is just, this in the next slide, you, are, you don't need to read them in detail, but they sent out a public questionnaire, you know, asking people for their views. This could be interpreted as what they call it, a public consultation. But the questions they asked are not exactly really fundamental to the constitutional order. Like, should the Constitution permit the taxing the cost of raising children? I mean, Maybe that's a constitutional question, but usually you think of that as kind of a policy question. Um, these were the first 12 questions. These were the second 12 questions. I really like, should the new constitution provide for the protection of, for the bi biodiversity of the Carpathian Basin? Burning constitutional question, right? They don't ask any questions about the competencies of public institutions, the needs for check on power, the independence of the, I mean, the kind of questions that are usually big questions in a constitutional drafting process. Moreover, the questionnaire was sent out at the beginning of March of last year. The new constitutional draft was presented in the middle of March, and people didn't even, only about, about one million people re replied out of the eight million Hungarian voters, uh, and the results of the questionnaire have never been announced. And because the constitutional draft came out two weeks after they sent, mailed the thing out, before they'd gotten the responses back, it doesn't actually look like they really used this much. Um, so then the question is, if they didn't have a constituent power, right, no public consultation, no other parties, didn't promise it, had no mandate, as soon as they start doing it, they lose power. So was there some prior um, actual constituent power? And this is a, I won't go through this in real detail, but basically the point of this slide is to say, in 1989-90, in there really was a set of processes put in place over a number of years through which there was a substantial overlapping consensus, both because there was an agreement at the round table originally to have a change of system, because the most contentious question actually at the round table, which was how the president would be selected, was put to a national referendum, which certified the result that they wound up with. Um, after the democratic election, there was another set of constitutional amendments, which were not just the result of the winning party in that election, but negotiated between the largest parties in the government and in the opposition. Um, there was all these constitutional court petitions that actually then challenged things that people didn't like. The constitutional court was wildly the most popular institution in Hungary through the 90s. Um, finally, when they tried to rewrite the constitution in 1995-96, they had a process. There was no consensus on changing things. Essentially, leaving it alone was the response that everybody got. So what I want to argue is that that process from 89 through 96, really, was a process of generating consent, a really deep and persistent and overlapping consent to the thing they had. So if there was a prior constituent power that wasn't replaced by a subsequent one, what did that constituent power decide? And this is where, you know, I have a lot of lot more evidence that I can show on the slide, but I think that what you saw in that design of the 8990 constitution 
was this persistent commitment to multi-partiness. Because after all, if you're coming out of a party state, what do you most want? You want multi-party guarantees. And there were lots of institutions, like for example on the media board, the way that was originally set up was that half the members of the media board had to be representatives of the governing party, and the other half had to be members of the opposition. And lots of institutions were set up like that. Ditto with the election of constitutional judges. You could not have one party ever capture the institutions, and so you saw this. There was also this really interesting tradition of self-limiting power through which um, when, the, when the first majority government was elected, they said, some things are so important, we don't want to decide them with majorities. And all the important topics were set for two-thirds votes because the government didn't have two-thirds. When there was a two-thirds government in 1994, that was when they amended the Constitution to say it needs a four-fifths to amend. So there had been this repeated um, you know, sign as part of the constitutional system that every government that got a majority would put fundamental change out of its reach so that it had to work with other parties. Uh, and finally, the constitutional court was a very strong protector of, of individual rights. Um, and so my argument is that if you had a constitution, or if you had a constituent power summoned in 89-90, then the principles that that constituent power stood for can't be violated unless you summon a new constituent power, which I want to claim they didn't actually do. Um, finally, and I'm just going to run through this last one very quickly. So I think the Constitution is unconstitutional because it didn't summon a new constituent power. Okay. Finally, um, I think the Constitution is also unconstitutional because it actually turns its back on some of the most important Hungarian constitutional traditions. And this argument is controversial because my liberal friends in Hungary think, why should we refer to our history? Don't we want to get over all that, right? And the, it's the nationalists and the folks on the right side of the political spectrum who typically make the arguments from history. Um, but this is where I think a constitution that actually ignores the specific history of a place also has problems. Um, the new preamble, this is the Hungarian crown guard, by the way. That's that. It, I always keep thinking it looks like something from a Monty Python sketch. But this is, this is the actual new uniform of the Hungarian crown guard. And these are some elements of, the, of this national avowal or the new preamble. And they're all of these references to Hungarian constitutional history um, and to Christianity and to the, uh, the legacy of St. Stephen and my favorite, the Holy Crown. Um, the Holy Crown. So... People on the right side of the Hungarian political spectrum, and particularly the far right of the Hungarian political spectrum, believe that this is actually the ancient and true constitution of Hungary. It's not a text, it's a thing. Um, and it was allegedly the crown given by the pope to the first Christian king of Hungary, Stephen, in the year 1000. Uh, and there's a current big debate over it um, going on, uh, sort of reflected in the slide. But basically, the right loves this thing and the left hates it. Um, and so the question is, okay, so let's start from where the right starts from on this national history of the crown. How do we understand what this thing stands for? Um, and what I want to argue is that there can be a liberal crown. And the first thing to say, and I'm sorry, the right slide is backwards. Um, when you look at the actual crown, it turns out that it can't be the crown given by uh, the Pope to Stephen in the year 1000. Because half the inscriptions, there's a hoop crown around the bottom, there's pieces over the top, and all the stuff around the bottom, all the inscriptions are in Greek. That's Greek backwards on the right. And on the cross pieces, all the inscriptions are in Latin. Which is to say, if you look at the object itself, it turns out that it actually probably dates from shortly thereafter. It's still an 11th century crown. But it wasn't the original crown. And actually, it's interestingly enough, a multicultural crown. You can see when you look underneath it that there are two pieces kind of joined together uh, in a somewhat clumsy way, unfortunately. Um, and so this is a crown that stands it's at the intersection of multiple traditions. Hungary got this crown when Hungary was on the border between the Eastern and Western churches, just around the time when there was a split in Christianity. And this turns out to be half a Byzantine crown, half Latin, uh, probably reliquary pieces. Um, and so what does this crown stand for? So first of all, it's multicultural. It doesn't stand for Hungary for the Hungarians, right? It stands for Hungary as the intersection of multiple traditions, I argue. Um, it's also the case that when you go back through Hungarian history and you look at what is really, you know, there are many medieval sources on the crown as the constitution of Hungary. This is not something the right made up. But in Hungarian constitutional theory, sovereignty always stays in the crown. It never goes to a person. So when a king is crowned, 
uh, and, and Hungary, like all the Eastern kingdoms, were all elective uh, kingships, the king never got sovereignty. The king was always granted temporary sovereignty and had to rule under the crown. These elective kingships rotated among ethnicities, so there were Polish kings, Angevin kings, Czech kings, all kinds of kings, some Hungarian kings, but I'm not even sure they were a majority. Um, the kingships in Hungary always rotated. Um, and Hungary, my favorite is this Aranbula from 1222. Uh, Hungary got something very like a Magna Carta, but without the toxic bits about Jews, actually, uh, in 1222. And there were a series of pacts made in the name of the crown that essentially preserved the rights of the nobility and further constrained the king. So I have a whole book on this, so I won't go through the whole thing. But basically, Hungary's got a really interesting history of constraints on power. Hungary never had unconstrained kings at least not governing in the name of the crown. So I'm happy to take the right up on their uh, thought that if you actually want to say this is the continuation of the Holy Crown of St. Stephen and a constitution unique to Hungarian nationalism, let's do it. Because what it stands for, in fact, are all of these principles that I've tried to derive from the liberal constitution, from the constituent power in 8990. It's basically inclusive, tolerant, multicultural, stands for self-limiting, democratic, rights-protecting power. OK, there's a whole book on that, which I won't go into. Um, and so all I want to say is that if you believe me on that, then we've got four different ways that you could find this whole constitution to be unconstitutional. Um, I've been through these four arguments. And all you have to do is accept one of them to believe that this is a bad idea. And so now the question is, what happens next? I'll leave this for the Q&A. But the EU is working on some of these arguments. Some of Hungary's opposition parties, insofar as they still exist, are working on others. And maybe in the room, we can work on more. So thank you. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Yeah. I led off with the double fluke of how this could go wrong, essentially, as right. a piece of constitutional drafting. But you know there's a lot of Dali and political scientists who mm -hmm. are looking for where you got this ugly set of votes. If Jobbik is popular, then you have something like 70% of the population voted 80. wrong. 80. 80. And equally, you know, who are Fidesz other than this amazing autonomous actor? What's the political economy of these guys? Yeah, good question. So, so the first thing is that the, the 2010 election was really disastrous if you you know, have any ideas about liberal government in Hungary. Um, so it was true that Fidesz got 53% of the vote, Jobbik got 17, Jobbik, the neo-Nazi party. So that meant that 80% of the Hungarian public had this swing to the right. Um, th I think in many ways that's just what you'd understand from the condition Hungary was in at the time of the election. So the socialists who were the main opposition party, Hungary functionally has had a two-party system with some minor parties around the edges by now. So the socialists anchor the left, Fidesz anchors the right, and then there's, there are these little pop-up party, this LMP is kind of a little youthful green party, Jobbik is a bigger kind of right-wing party, but essentially it's a two-party system. The socialists have been in government for eight years, and things had not gone well under their watch, partly because they misgoverned and partly because the world went to hell in a handbasket for reasons not of their own making, but it was a combination. So it was time for the other guys to win. You know, in a two-party system, that's what happens. So that's, that's part of it. But also, Hungary was the first country to get an IMF bailout. Uh, their bailout came in February of 2008, which is to say that Hungary had, was the leading edge of the financial crisis. And so what that meant was that the government had essentially collapsed before. The socialists um, had actually had a constructive vote of no confidence to put in a caretaker technocratic prime minister on their own right before this election, who had kind of stabilized things, but the party that ran them into the, you know, into the into the ditch essentially was the one standing for election against Fidesz. So it was time for the socialists to lose. Okay. And there were no other parties, you know? So I think that Fidesz's victory is very much a, a function of the socialist collapse and discreditation, being discredited, also of the economic crisis, but also of the fact that Fidesz stands for all things to all people, right? So it's not a very ideological party. So it's got a kind of nationalist veneer, you know, Hungary for the Hungarians, but it's, that can mean ethnic exclusivity, or it can mean we're sick of being kicked around by the world. Um, and so, and, and the guys who are running Fidesz are not, they're pragmatists more than they are real ideologues. So a lot of people who were not on board with the whole nationalist thing could vote for Fidesz thinking, time for a change. Enough was broken that time for a change was kind of a good thing. So 
Essentially, it's the lack of options, it's the economic situation, and the fact that Fidesz didn't look so toxic to a lot of people before they, they got into power. But there's a second part. What kind of half answer to just what's the political economy oh, of yeah. Fidesz? Yeah, so actually that's a really interesting question. So this is um, what keeps them going. So Hungary doesn't have a whole lot of natural resources. Hungary doesn't have oil, doesn't have a lot of things that keep them in power. So. Essentially, the political economy is that people are economically dependent on their party. Fifty percent of the GDP of Hungary runs through the government somehow, which is not to say that everything's, a, you know, the public sector, but government contracts, government subsidies, government stuff is everywhere in the economy. So when you win the government, you got a lot of goodies to give out, you know. And so it's essentially mayor, you know, the first mayor daily Chicago gone national that there's a lot of people involved in patronage jobs. They, you know, so they can create these webs of dependencies. But then again, so did the socialists, right? If you capture the government and they have 50% of the GDP, you have a lot to give out. So, so just getting the government, and especially getting a government with two thirds where you, you don't have to listen to anybody else, is, is a guarantee that all of your supporters will get all the goodies the state has to give out. Other questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I guess this is a tricky question. It, it's a little bit going on in, on what you've already started talking about, about the political economy. Mm -hmm. But if you take for, so take as given that this has been a power grab on Fides, Fidesz's part, mm -hmm. um, and thinking, I, I'd like you to say more about, about Hungary's position in Europe, in yeah. the EU, and why the, the, the thinking be behind why they think this is a necessary thing to do and that it's a moral thing to do. Yeah. Because that's part of the rhetoric. It's not just we're power hungry, but there's, not, like, yeah. th there's a necessity to it. And yeah. Let me take that in, in reverse and start with the necessity back to the, you know, what entitlement back to the EU question. So the first thing is that I think it's really um, their opponents really um, underestimate how much in Hungary was truly broken. You know, I mean, a lot of stuff in Hungary appeared to work and didn't. Um, so just to give you, like, the public schools, which have been nationalized, um, it turns out that when the public schools were, were um, refragmented, you know, as a way of breaking up the communist power structure, um, local schools were funded as local schools are in lots of parts of the United States with essentially local taxes. Um, and the Constitution specifies which taxes can be collected at the national, which can be collected at the local level, and the local governments had almost no resources. So essentially what you found is that rich districts had good schools and poor districts had bad schools. And moreover, since there was no national coordination of the curriculum, if you moved with your kid from one neighborhood in Budapest to another, your kid might have to go forward a grade, back a grade, because there was no coordination of what happens in third grade. So there was a huge discontent with the public schools. And you can run that through the public health system, which was also decentralized. Hospitals were run by regional governments. I mean, and that was, so many things were not working. Um, or for example, take the media. So I didn't really go on about the media council, which has now exercised a, quite a lot of control over broadcast print and online media through a media board elected for nine years by, you guessed it. Uh, anyway, so you so the media board is now kind of you know having a sort of Damocles over the head of the media. It turns out what's going on with the media is that um, the biggest advertiser in Hungary before this election, and ever since 1989-90, is the government. So the government, everything from the lottery to the public transportation system to the national airline, which now folded, so they don't have any more ads. But you know the government was the largest advertiser in all of the private media. So what happens when Fidesz came to power? It just cut all the advertising for the opposition or critical media, but is funding the other. But they shouldn't have had a media sector dependent on public advertising to begin with. It looked like a private media sector, but it wasn't. And you can go on and on and on through, you know, the universities. I mean, don't even get me started. So, so virtually every public institution was rotten all the way through because of the fact that the transition had whatever, had not fully really fixed things, and the private sector is shot through with public money all the way through. There are public sub subsidies for almost everything. And that system is just not tenable. So stuff had to change, and a lot of people who voted for Fidesz voted for Fidesz because they promised change. And insofar as Fidesz has support, I didn't have a graph that shows you Fidesz now, depending on the poll, if an election were held tomorrow and who would you vote for, that question, Fidesz gets 20 to 25 percent of the public. Now the problem is, 
ev it's still the most popular party because between depending on the poll between 45 and 55 percent of the public says no party <sighs> so you know there's this massive discontent with the whole political space in Hungary politics is considered a dirty business all kinds of people who might be logical opposition candidates are not going to run because as one of them told me I'm not a politician I said well you could become one no I can't you know, it's just, it's a dirty space. So a lot of stuff was truly, truly broken. And when people voted for Fidesz, they voted to fix it. The problem with a lot of Fidesz is, and, and, and the people who still support them, support them because they're root and branch changing the school system. They're going to completely renovate the public health system. They're going to go after all of this corruption by which everyone meant state subsidies and all kinds of state-supported things, which, you know, and the socialists did it too. When the socialists came to, par to power, they defund the Fidesz stuff. And this is a more profound defunding than we've ever seen before, but it's a matter of degree, not of, you know, so things were not well in Hungary before. And this election and the mandate for radical change that Fidesz claims it has comes from the fact that a lot was really, really, really messed up. So, so the people who support Fidesz are supporting them sectorally. You know, yes, we needed education reform and so forth. But almost, but all the Fidesz changes are what I've been calling dual-use technologies, right? So you could fix the school system without replacing all the principles with what we, you know, we haven't seen it yet, but it's just a hypothesis. It could be a lot of people who like Fidesz. Um, and if, if they do that, they will have used the opportunity for reform to change it in a different way, right? So, so anyway, the end result of this, I think, is not going to necessarily be an improvement. It's just going to be an entrenchment of a different elite in power throughout the political spectrum. And a lot of the people who were in those elite positions were people who had some beneficial position in the Soviet, you know, period and used their leverage, you know, either because they got places at universities, they got to speak foreign languages, all of which were politically controlled in the Soviet time, to leverage that into a position of power. So this is a kind of elite rotation, I think, is what's going on, but it's also an elite rotation and entrenchment. It's not going to allow future rotations, which is why I have my criticism. So what's the EU doing? Well, Hungary in part could do this because the new constitution and much of this stuff that is really worrisome on the on the rotation of power dimension happened during the six months that Hungary held the rotating presidency of the EU. And when you hold the rotating presidency of the EU, it means your minister of whatever is the council of whatever leader in the EU. So they were sitting on top of the entire EU structure when they did this, and therefore the EU couldn't act while it was going on because Hungarians ran everything in the, you know, in the in sort of in and around the commission and the council of ministers. And anyway, so as soon as Hungary gets out, there's a bunch of resolutions. The commission starts to act. The parliament, European parliament votes two days after, you know, Orban leaves office, uh, a condemnatory resolution. So it was pretty clear from how quickly the EU picked up the ball after the un end of the Hungarian rotating presidency that the Hungarians must have been sitting on things in Brussels. And then by the time Brussels got to act, it was a done deal. This went through so quickly that there was no chance to respond. So now the EU is really working on all fronts to try to do something about this. So the Commission has launched a series of what are called infringements a infringement actions, which means elements of this are, are thought by the Commission to be in violation of EU law. This is a long, drawn-out process that will probably result in three to four years of litigation uh, going through the ECJ, we expect. And the end result of it won't be that much, actually. Um, so for example, one of the infringement actions they've launched is, again, is, on, is for age discrimination because Hungary lowered the retirement age for judges. So imagine what's going to happen. So Hungary's now busily replacing all the judges. All those folks are out. Just They're gone. Um, so when you get through four years of litigation, the end result of the ECJ will be maybe to make Hungary pay a fine and then to say, and now you should raise the retirement ages and give additional protection to the independence of your judges. Okay, so you see, I mean, Hungary will be thrilled to do that in four years after they've replaced all the judges, right? And so the infringement actions have this problem. Um, there's also now a process going through um, ECOFIN or the Council of Financial Ministers to possibly cut some of Hungary's what are called cohesion funds, which are monies from the EU that go to development projects in uh, some of the poor uh, EU states, which Hungary still counts as one of. Um, and that's 2% of GDP. And um, ECOFIN voted to start cutting Hungary's cohesion funds. But now the problem is the only basis you can use for cutting the cohesion funds is if a country is persistently running a deficit, which Hungary has never been in 
in, um, in compliance with EU deficit rules since it joined the EU in 2004. It's the only country that has never been in compliance. So, you know, they could, um, so they've launched this proceeding because Hungary is violating the debt rules. Well, so there's a whole bunch of other countries violating the debt rules, and they don't want this infringement action launched against, I mean, this, this cohesion funds cut launched against them. So Hungary suddenly picked up a bunch of allies of countries that don't like what Fidesz is doing, but they're afraid they're going to be in the crosshairs if all of a sudden the budget targets are going to start getting enforced. So, and now the European Parliament is moving down the road toward launching what's called an Article 7 procedure, which never been used before, um, is a procedure through which, if it goes all the way to completion, Hungary would be deprived of its vote in all EU matters. So it will essentially suffer civil death in a legal fashion if this happens. Well, it turns out there's lots of high hurdles. And Hungary, um, this Fidesz party is a member of the European People's Party fraction in the parliament. 20 of the 27 member states of the EU currently belong to that fraction. And Hungary's been drumming up a fair amount of support in the European parliament from others because Orban says, well, you saw the, the Christian language in the preamble. They're going after this us because we're a Christian state. And so they've mobilized a few states to support them for that. Or they're saying, they're just singling us out. This is double standards, you know, and you can't stand for an EU of double standards. He never went after Berlusconi, they never went, you know. So it's going to be a hard slog for the EU to kind of figure out what it's going to do with respect to this. Um, that said, there are a lot of interesting new creative theories on offer, one of which uh, Daniel Halberstam here has been responsible for elaborating, right? And so, um, and so, which is, anyway, so it's complicated to explain, but basically there may be some new EU theories through which um, Hungarian compliance with EU law may have to generate more change domestically. And that's going to be hard to leverage because nobody knows exactly what's going on here with respect to that. I mean, this is all, these are all untried theories. Um, but it's, it's an interesting time for people who work on EU law to think about. So, you know, Hungary is to the moral center of Europe what Greece is to the Eurozone, right? Suddenly you realize that you thought you were all in a club in which everybody agreed to follow common rules and now somebody's not. And now you realize you don't have the political mechanisms to bring people back into line. So this is just now starting a whole bunch of discussions in the EU about what can you do when a country falls from the, from the path of, of you know, multi-party democratic rights respecting states. That is, in a sense, Hungary's been in a sulk for a hundred years. A thousand years, actually. Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> but let's take the last hundred. Yeah. Since the right. Treaty of Trianon. Well, yes. Almost. Right. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Oh. Um, so Hungary got broken up. Half of its territories disappeared. <coughs> and you now have all these ethnic Hungarians in other countries. Right. <coughs> to whom I gather mm -hmm. Fidesz is appealing and even right. saying, we'll give votes to you because you're ethnic Hungarians. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So there is this sort of long-standing yeah. resentment right. among the Hungarians, That's right. yeah. which Fidesz has had the opportunity to play on. That's right. And which even probably they can appeal to in their standing off against the EU. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's really. I'm sorry about your coffee. Um, no, it's sorry. it's really it's a it's a great point because it's uh, so for those of you who don't know. Uh, Central European history, or particularly the Hungarian version of it. Um, Hungary used to be a lot bigger than it is now. Um, now, uh, Hungary had not been independent for, it had been part of the Ottoman Empire, then part of the Habsburg Empire, but still, I mean, Hungary used to be, I mean, it, well, it used to be a lot bigger and used to be, ha cover a lot more people than it does now. At the end of the First World War, as part of the breakup of the, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Hungary lost well, the way it describes it is um, two-thirds of its territory and three-quarters of its population over what its prior size had been. And, and this was partly, and, and you know, I, I'm, I teach now at the Woodrow Wilson School, and I, it's really awful to go and have your Woodrow Wilson on your card because Woodrow Wilson was very involved in the Treaty of Trianon, which resulted in all of this being cut up. So I've been thinking about getting new cards, actually, just to kind of not immediately get everybody's back up. Um, so there has been, you know, since that time, the right wing of Hungarian politics has been devoted to rewriting the Treaty of Trianon. Yeah, um, and that's what I was trying to 
so yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's, that's, that's exactly, I, I see what you're saying. And it's true that this has been since that time. So, so the interwar government in Hungary was a right-wing, not fully fascist, quasi-fascist government that was really devoted to irredentism and trying to rewrite the treaty and trying to reunify the population um, and so forth. Um, one of the reasons why Hungary uh, sided with Nazi Germany in the Second World War was that Hitler promised Hungary that all the treaty would be revised, right? So Hungary's gotten into a lot of mischief over this question. Um, and this government is capitalizing on this kind of Trianon um, revenge as part of its public rhetoric, okay? Now, this is dangerous and not, okay? So it's dangerous in the sense that anytime you propose to rewrite all the borders of Europe, it, you know, or any part of the world these days, it gets the attention of international uh, powers, which is exactly why Hungary won't do it. So I don't actually believe in a million years that they really want to revise the borders. That said, it's a way to whip up a certain kind of frenzy. It's a way to appeal to the right side of the Hungarian political spectrum. Um, and more crucially, I think it's a way to, um, well, it's, it's going to be a way for Fidesz to stay in power because what they've now done, um, and actually this is an interesting feature of the Treaty of Trianon, was that when they ethnic Hungarians who were over the borders lost their Hungarian citizenship. So if you were Hungarian and you had left in 1918 and come to the United States, you maintained your Hungarian citizenship. If you were Hungarian but you wound up in Slovakia after, you know, in Czechoslovakia after they created the borders, you lost your citizenship. So there was a unique loss of citizenship for the Hungarians who lived nearby. And what the new constitution has done, and, and in some ways you can see why they're doing it, is, is restoring citizenship lost as a result of a treaty the Hungarian government doesn't want to recognize now, which raises some interesting questions. So they've given the possibility of taking out citizenship to all the Hungarians over the borders. Appeals to the nationalist sentiment. So what does this do? Well, the surveys that have been done um, of who those Hungarians are over the borders indicate that only about half the ethnic Hungarians living outside the borders would take out citizenship. Um, but in that half, 80% would vote for Fidesz, okay? So it's a way to kind of buffer their electoral gains. Um, the problem is, you know, Fidesz, they might not say that they might also vote for Jobbik, which is the farther to the right um, party. So I think that's what's really going on here, is that it's a lot of nationalist rhetoric, a lot of smoke and noise. They're too smart to really rewrite the Treaty of Trianon. But this way they get these voters, and I think that's actually what they're on about. This is, I mean, what's so interesting to me about this government is that um, Viktor Orban, who's the prime minister, uh, and his followers are often called Arbanians, or he's called the dictator. I mean, there's all kinds of things um, that happen with this. But um, he and his circle are incredibly smart people. I mean, these are really, you're not, I mean, you sh I mean, and this is where I think Europe has really underestimated them, because I think many kind of sophisticated cosmopolitan Europeans assume that when they're dealing with populists, they're stupid. You know, and this group is way too smart to underestimate them, and they're not... I don't think they're really so ideological. I think they're very pragmatic, and behind most of these, these things that, are, that make a kind of nationalist appeal, there is instead something else going on, and it's something that basically maintains them in power. So I think this is about the vote. Um, you might ask about the, the Catholic part, because that's another big chunk of this. Um, it turns out Hungary's in budget trouble. It needs, um, it needs to um, find money somewhere, and it doesn't have natural resources. And I think that they're planning to fleece the Catholic Church, quite frankly. So one of the laws I didn't talk about uh, here, which has gotten a little bit of attention, is that Hungary used to have 350 registered churches. And as a result of a changed new law, they've now deregistered more than 300 of them. So you were a church yesterday, you're not a church today. And what that means is no tax exemptions. You could, ap you could apply for funds to run religious schools. All that's gone. Um, and, I, you know, everyone's wondering, what do they have against all these churches? And I, I think what's going on is that I looked at the list of churches because I'm thinking, okay, so this might be a little bit of a clue. The Catholic Church had the Catholic Church, and then it had the Franciscans and the Dominicans and then Opus Dei and then the Ca Catholic University. And there were about 20 or 25 different Catholic pieces on that list. And now there's only one recognized Catholic Church. And it means that I talked to some of my friends who are in these various orders, and they told me all of a sudden it's serious centralization of the Catholic Church in Hungary. And the Catholic Church is very grateful for the help to rein in everybody and prevent dissent within the church. 
And in exchange, I think, what, what Orban is going to ask them, and he's already done it in a lot of small villages all over the country, but I think it's, what's coming is a bigger play, is to ask the, ask the Catholic Church so they can offload much of the public educational system, which has now been centralized, into church hands so that they pay for it and it gets it off the state budget. This is just a guess. Okay, this is my prediction. Watch, you know, a year from now, let's see what happens with all these principles and stuff. But this is, you know, the, the Catholic Church has already been steadily picking up the cost of public education all over the country in small villages, and this will allow them to centralize it. So that's just my guess. There may be something else going on. But it, it turns out that behind everything, there will be something that's about keeping them in power. Okay, this is, again, it's a testable hypothesis where we can see with all the new stuff that they're coming online with that, you know, if that turns out to be the case, then you'll see that this is really a power grab more than it is, you know, a, a, a constitution-making process that will give Hungarians their voice. It may take away the voice of lots of people for a long time. Sorry, I'm answering all questions in a long fashion. Okay. Sorry, but... What about the inst international institutions that aren't the EU? Uh, are they either doing good or at least destabilizing this? <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, it's really hard to know what the institutions are that are not the EU that could have any say in this. So, so for example, I do know that uh, NATO's been wondering what they could do, but they already gave up that game with Turkey, right? Um, I mean, so it turns out, you know, the IMF is sitting it out waiting for the EU to approve on some of the stuff before the IMF loans money. That can actually happen because the EU and the, and the European Central Bank have to sign off on any IMF loan within uh, the EU. So the IMF is really in the hands of the EU. Um, it, there aren't that many other points of leverage here, actually. I mean, the U.S. has issued a number of strong statements over the last year of increasing undiplomatic language, you know, how diplomatic, they, you know, they, the, the thing where they praise the country gets shorter and shorter and the part where they complain about stuff gets longer and longer. And, and so the U.S. is completely on top of this. I mean, and the U.S. would love to have some point of leverage, but what leverage does the U.S. actually have? I mean, so it's, it's a little bit unclear who really can have leverage apart from the EU. Uh, on all of this stuff. Um, I think Hungary's real real weak spot is the fact that its economy is in a, in a mess and partly when a country runs 50% of its GDP through the government and the government's broke, um, this is going to be a real problem for the country. So I think ultimately the levers are going to be financial. I mean, that that's really the weak spot. And these... So the Orban in this circle are all lawyers, right? So you can see they've done this amazing job with the law. None of them are economists. And you can see that they hadn't really thought about how this whole thing gets funded. So I think a lot of the ad hoc policies they're coming up with now are designed to fix those things. And so just to give you one example, uh, in their first year in office, they had this massive, they realized they were going to way overshoot the budget deficits that they were permitted by the EU to run. So they basically told every Hungarian, you have Social Security, where you're going to get a pension from the government because you paid into it all your life with their equivalent of FICA taxes. And then you have private pensions, you know, like our 401ks. Um, now they say, if you want to preserve your Social Security, you have to hand us all your 401ks, or else when you retire, you won't get Social Security. Okay, so first of all, that ran directly counter to a decision of the Constitutional Court. One of the problems here is that this is a constitutional court, as you saw, it was really powerful. It's got, I mean, a lot of constitutional law in Hungary is constitutional court decisions, not the prior text. But now that they've got a new constitution, it's completely unclear which, if any, of the constitutional court decisions are still valid. And the constitutional court has not made a pronouncement about that. So the government periodically does stuff that runs directly against a prior constitutional court decision. And who's going to tell them they can't? And they try it out, and then they get emboldened to do the next one. So there was a decision of the Constitutional Court that said people had property interests in Social Security because they were required to pay into the system. So you can't cut them off from it. Now, the court was a little vague about the level of the benefits, and they didn't get into the numbers, but you couldn't cut people off. So direct violation of a court decision. And the government said, if you, you know, they, the threat, if you don't bring us your 401k, Social Security is cut. So 80% of the public moves their 401ks into the government hands, which the government then uses as a one-off budget hole plugger, <laughs> you know. And then when the Constitutional Court starts making some noises before it was totally packed, they said, oops, 
we, we're only kidding. You can get your Social Security even if you didn't move the, your money back into the public system. But there's no way to get your money out of the public system. And now there's no legal, if you're going to rely on current standing, right, which is to say the government's saying you could, you could take your, pub, pub, you know. Anyway, so the government's been doing stuff like that. Um, and so you'd think this would get the Hungarian public a little more fed up than they've been. But um, it's, it's, this, this has got, like I said, 8,000 cases before the European Court of Human Rights on this question. And my guess is that the European Court of Human Rights will not think well of this policy. But what's the sanction? The sanction is a bunch of tiny fines, which will increase the budget deficit. And then they'll have to look for other things that they can. Um, there has been, uh, finally, just one last thing. There has been what I call a bank walk. This is something a number of financial journalists in Hungary have told me, that a number of Hungarians watching that the government needs to plug budget holes is really concerned that if you have your money in bank accounts in Hungary, the government will find some way to take it. So anybody with any substantial resources has long since moved their money out of the country. Every rich person in Hungary no longer has bank accounts in Hungary. And now it's filtering down to the middle class. And so there is what I call a bank walk. It's not a bank run. They're not all lining up, and but it's just slowly. You see, and I, you know, this has happened. Many of my friends, you know, they go to their banks, they withdraw all the money in cash, they convert it to euros, they take the train to Vienna, and they deposit it in a Viennese bank, you know, an Austrian bank in Vienna. Now, Rafeson has banks branches all over Hungary, but nobody trusts that the foreign banks are going to be able to to withstand government pressures to turn over the funds. And so this has been so substantially big enough problem that the for a while the head of the central bank was calling the prime minister every day at three to report how much money was leaving Hungarian banks. Um, so you know what's going to what's going to bring down this government may be the economic side of it but you know and this is where I'm trying to work with the team of people so okay if if there can be a change of government what do you do with this whole thing? Right, this whole struct, I mean, this whole thing, the crown, but you know, but the constitution, right? Is there a way that you can roll this thing back without a formal break in legality and without just having a massive, you know, um, you know, shake up of everything in a way that will make things worse? So that's what some of us are thinking about now. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>